Finishing up Revelation. Now, that doesn't mean Revelation is coming to an end, but that's the end of studying the book of Revelation. Uh, Wednesday at 10, you're welcome to join us here in the sanctuary. Uh, also, uh, the Phillies game, uh, tickets, uh, we're trying to get them, uh, uh, get those turned in by the day, to get those tickets ordered. So we need 25 to get the group rate, and if we get that many, then we'll look at maybe getting a bus as well. So uh, if you'd like to order, uh, get those tickets, please make sure the check's in today for that. Uh, we're starting a new uh, time of fellowship tonight. Starting a new series today on uh, seven deadly sins, and, and you'll see a purple insert in your bulletin. Uh, that is for discussion. Uh, the goal tonight at six o'clock to come back in the, in the community hall and to uh, bring your own dinner and to have a time of discussion. And we invite you to come back for that time to go a little deeper uh, in thinking about uh, what we're talking about today. That'll be each each, each Sunday night as we go. <laughs> So we invite you to join us. That's the one thing that has been uh, lacking or last to kind of catch up is uh, dialogue with one another, Christian dialogue and fellowship. And so we hope to have that uh, these Sunday nights as we move forward. And I think that is all the announcements that we have. Um, I invite you to stand for our call to worship. <clears throat> the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He is slow to anger and a great promise. The Lord is loving to everyone. His, his compassion is over all his works. Bow with me in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks. We thank you, Lord, for your compassion. We thank you for your love. As we've gathered here, we pray again that your spirit might speak to our hearts. Meet us where we are. We've all had different experiences this past week. Some good, some not so good. But God, as we gather here in your name, we pray for your spirit to minister to our hearts as we worship and honor you. We ask this all in the name of Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's sing together again. It's in the hymnal number 64. Holy, holy, holy.
our childhood that engages our bodies and our minds and our spirits. And so uh, we're going to sing together if you're happy and you're happy. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Continue our worship and thanks unto God as we give back to God for the blessings He's given us in offering and again as we've been doing. We invite you to come forward and place your offering in the offering plate uh, again. Smile on your face as you see the other folks who are here today. Give a good smile. Let's continue our worship of God again. And so I was kind of a bummer now. What's interesting, every game, every game, we 
play, the teams would line up and we'd shake hands. We'd shake hands with them, and we'd always say something like, good game, good game, good game. Now, when we were winning, when we beat the other team, it's like, good game. You know? When we lost, and, and you know, I'm like, I didn't really want to say good game because I want you want to win when you play, right? Any sport you do, you just want to win. Pride is when you ask people to look at yourself and you want all the attention. You always want the attention and you're boasting or you're bragging about, it. look what I did. And we're not supposed to have pride, we're supposed to have humility. Humility is when you put other people first. So I want to ask you, what are some things you could do to show people that you care about them? What are some things you could do to show people that you care about them? What do you think? Smile, smile at them. Smile at them. That's a great thing. I see a lot of people that are deep frowns, right? Anybody here that I should say that is frowning, right? You can smile at them, and when you smile at somebody, what happens? They usually smile back at you, don't they? That's a great idea. It's wonderful. What are some things you can do? You can ask somebody without them asking for your help. That's good. Like, like what? What would be something you think you could do for somebody? Say, like, my mom was cleaning the house. Oh, okay. Ask for help. Okay. So mom's cleaning the house instead of waiting for her to ask for help. You just automatically help them. That's a great one, mom. That's it. That's good. And what else could you do to show somebody that you, you, want, you want to help them and care about them? Um, Any other ideas? Maybe you always greet them and like, in a good way and just okay. okay. So when you greet somebody in a good way, that might be you know shaking their hand or a fist bump, or it could be also smiling at them, or it could be uh, Saying their name. I noticed one thing that was really important when I was a school teacher, when I said the, the, the people's names, that was very important to make sure we know one another's names. That's another good thing. Anything else you can do? I made a short list up here. You could hold the door open for somebody at the store. You could clean your room before someone asks you. Oh, wow. Dig out the trash and help with the dishes. These are all things you can figure out how Let somebody go ahead of you in line first. That's a big one. You're out shopping or you're doing something. Instead of trying to get in front of the other person, let them go first. So again, we're supposed to be kind to other people, not be proud in the sense of wanting everybody to look at us and draw attention to us. And when you do something nice, don't always think somebody's going to say thank you. It's nice when you get a thank you, but if you're always looking for the pat on the back or the thank you, then it's back about you. And it shouldn't be about you. It should be about other people. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, I thank you for these young people. I ask you to be with them, help them understand how important it is to not be prideful, but to put other people ahead of, ahead of themselves. Be with them now, they go to Sun Texas. Help them learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys. I don't want to Sun Texas. Good to see you all today. I'm going to take a few minutes to share together any words of praise or thanks to them. Anyone have a word of praise this morning? Yes? It was a terrifying week at our house. God, God was with us. Uh, we had some really scary incidences. One with my daughter, Abby, um, a neighbor's across the dog uh, attacked on our property. Oh, and terrifying is the only word I can think of with both cases. And thank God, Addie's okay, Good. our dogs are okay, Good. and God is done. Amen. Amen. And Addie had a birthday, just we see that. Yeah, she had a birthday. Amen. 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 Wow. Great. Oh, thank God for that protection. Amen. Anyone else word of praise today? Yes. My new job is going to me. Wonderful. Addie and Shelly, one of the best things I could have ever done. Amen. Good. That's great to hear you all. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, um, last Sunday I was in the hospital, this Sunday I'm here. Amen. 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 Are you going to say something about Randy? Did you get the email? I didn't get that, no. Oh. No, no, oh. no, I didn't get anything. <laughs> okay. Give, me, give us an update. Yeah. I didn't kind of hear anything about it. Um, well, I did a little bit, but you yeah. go ahead. Yes. Mary, Mary Jo sent a text um, this week that said that Randy had his first PET scan since his treatment started. And that the tumor that was in his shoulder is gone.
problem. The tumors that are in his chest are shrinking and the one in his throat is decreasing in size. So all good yes. results. Yes. So, yes. Prayers for <laughs> yes. so that's, Amen. That's a Amen. Prayers for Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I think Mary Jo's online here too. She says good morning. <laughs> okay. so, yes. so she's watching. Anyone else a word of praise today? I have two, two quick things. One, we were working in the thrift store. It was Men's Day yesterday. And I'm looking at somebody, and I'm like, they look familiar to me, and who are they? Uh, it's somebody I haven't seen in 30 years. Wow. Or I should say they haven't seen me in 30 years as well. But it was a, 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 a woman now. It was a young girl from the Alpine Church. We'd gone on a mission trip to Barbados back in 1991. Wow. And uh, she was checking out. Her mother was with her. She's like, you look familiar. I told her I was. She was and I don't, then it clicked. Uh, and again, it's just amazing, 30 years go by, how quickly those things go by. But uh, again, this the, the, the opportunity to go to uh, Barbados, which I hadn't thought about. We did a VBS down there back in 1991. Uh, and uh, I stepped on a sea urchin. A lot of memories start coming back that are good at it uh, in regard to that. But uh, it was neat to see her again, uh, Amy. And it was good to, uh, to talk to her uh, briefly. The second thing is my brother, Michael, Four years older than me, is living in Michigan. He's moving back uh, the end of this coming week to New Jersey. I'm grateful for that. Helped with my mom and different things. My mom's doing pretty well. Lord willing, uh, she's going to be moving back to her place on Tuesday a week. And uh, he'll be here to help her take care of those different things. We'll see her together next Sunday after church. Uh, he'll be driving in and we'll be meeting her where she is. And, and I'll be handing off the ball because uh, two weeks from now we'll be out away on vacation. So, uh, just grateful for that as well. We appreciate my brother. And the big thing about him is he was going to retire, but again, issues with insurance and those kind of things. And he asked his boss to stay on to work from home, which home now would be New Jersey. And his boss said, sure, and went to HR. They said no. And his boss went to back firm and he called me this week and said he's able to work from New Jersey. And so grateful, grateful for that uh, as well. Found out there's other people from the company also working. So, so uh, glad that he's uh, able to come back and glad for that good news uh, for my brother Michael. Uh, things to keep in prayer. Uh, I do ask to keep my mom in prayer. Uh, she has good days and bad days. She's getting the rehab that she needs and seems to be stronger than she was. Again, her name's Teresa. She's 91 years old. Uh, had a stroke back in February, for those who may not have heard that. And, uh, but she's, she's hopefully going back to uh, uh, where she's been living up in, up in Seoul uh, next week. And uh, hopefully all those things work out. Other things we need to keep in prayer. Kelly Seegers is having health problems again. Okay. Keep Kelly Seegers in our prayers for health. Yes, go. I'm a little bit of this. Okay. The Galvin family on the loss of Tommy Jr. He was killed in the motorcycle accident this week. The Needham family on the loss of Michael from an overdose. And one of my co-workers from the old job, she lost her, her name is Michelle, she lost her sister Carol, mm -hmm. suddenly, yesterday. And for Wesley, who is uh, really struggling with what's going on in the world today, uh, he's in Japan. And uh, there's a lot going on, guys. So just prayers for our, our main game services. Yes. Okay. yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Other concerns today? So go to the Lord in prayer. I would invite you again. The altar is always open, but let's sing our chorus. If you'd like to come and lay your burdens here, we invite you to do that. Let's sing together through it all.
Heavenly Father, we are humbled and grateful that we can come in your presence in prayer. We can unite our hearts. That, Lord, we're two or more gathered, that you're there in the midst. We're gathered in your name, God, and you're with us. You call us into relationships, God, with each other and relationship with you, and we are grateful, God, for that. We're grateful, God, for your hand of protection. We continue to lift up Kate and Dale as they travel and for other protections through this week. As we shared, God, there are things that we've all been through. And we are grateful again for the wisdom you give us, the patience you give us, and the safety that you give us. We also recognize, God, today that we live in a, in a fallen world and that we are not immune to problems and difficulties and challenges. We pray, Lord, for these that have been mentioned this morning that are, that are struggling with loss, for the Gallon family and the Needle family, for Michelle, those others, God, that we know that are, are struggling in these days. We pray for your peace and strength upon their lives, for, for Kelly and for her health, God. We ask you to help her and give her wisdom, draw it to the right people, the right, right timing, God. We are grateful, God, for your timing in our lives. We're grateful, God, for the paths that cross one another unaware of. And if we just notice and recognize people that we know, people we haven't seen. We're grateful, God, for opportunities to serve you and to serve others, God, whether it be on, on mission trips, God, or whether it be serving in the thrift or serving God here in, in Sunday school or working, God, in our, in our school, Lord, helping these families and these children. We do pray for our young people, God. We pray that they will be grounded in your truth, that they will know your truth, that as they get older and as they get out there, Lord, and as they are exposed to different things, as, as Dawn had shared about Wesley today and others in the military, God, as they had different upbringings, but God, as they're now out there on their own and have to make choices and decisions and have all these influences around them, we pray for their wisdom and we pray for their patience and their strength. We always pray, God, for a hedge of protection around our children, wherever they may be, wherever they may go, when they're in our sight, and when they're, most, most importantly, when they're out of our sight. Continue, God, to bless our young people. Help them get grounded in your truth, understanding your love, understanding, Lord, a parent's love for their, their children, understanding, God, that they're never alone. Continue, God, to guide us in these days as your people, that we might think even today and understand more fully your word, your truth. We might apply that truth to our lives as we seek to grow and mature. We thank you, God, for a message you've given us, a message not to keep to ourselves but to share with others. May our words, may our actions be seen not to give credit to ourselves, God, but to point people towards you. As we continue in worship, may your spirit encourage us, enlighten us, as we seek to honor and worship you, God. Unite us now as we pray the prayer that you taught your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask us to sing again. Let's stand to this beautiful hymn, How Great Thou Art, O Lord.
And so if I say anything that's like, I'm not sure I agree with what he said there. Let's, let's talk about that, that this evening. But if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, the serpent is always trying to put into our mind that if we really trust God, it's going to limit us. It's going to focus us on the don'ts, on the, on the negative things, the things that you shouldn't do. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Again, we're reminded that God is in the life-giving business. The serpent is in the death business. Verses 4. You will not truly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her 
and he ate it. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, it is not easy sometimes to deal with those things that are so common to us, that are inside of us to think about. Those secret places that maybe God we're ashamed of sometimes. But God, we're grateful that you always look on us with pleasure. There's nothing we can do that will cast us away from your presence. So as your children here today, God, we come trusting you to do in us, to continue to create in us, to change us, to transform us, because God, you made us to be something amazing, something marvelous. Help us understand that. Help us see that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to notice the focus of the serpent's attack. The serpent is not attacking Eve's belief in God. He's attacking her trust in God. The agenda of the serpent is to get Adam and Eve to turn their dependence and their trust that's in God into self-reliance or self-trust, self-dependence. And the way the serpent does this is to get them and to us and us to doubt the goodness of God. Now, in all this, I think as we seek to be followers of Jesus, and I make the assumption that if you're here today, you're here because you want to follow Jesus, you want to learn, you want to be a person of integrity, you love the Lord, and, 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 and every one of us, no matter how long we've been on this journey with Jesus, we, we struggle with how we view God. And then doubts that can come up because we're bombarded with all these other ideas every day. And we can doubt and we can distrust even within ourselves. I think that's why Jesus came and, and taught people to see that God isn't some distant person, distant figure out there, some distant spirit that is just holy and angry and judgmental. And in fact, there were times in the Jewish Orthodox Church, even today, you can't even say, they won't say God. They'll spell out G-O-D because they, they, they have this fear, this, this respect that no human being is righteous enough to even say God's name. And here comes Jesus on the scene. And he says, let me tell you about God. He's Abba. Father. He, he takes it to a, to a personal relationship. You could call him Daddy. It helps us to understand more that God loves us as a parent loves a child, their child. I put out there the idea that there's nothing a parent wouldn't do for their child or their children. Nothing. If your children, if a child is sick, you would say, let me be sick on their behalf. Take their sickness away so that I would be sick. You would do anything for your children. There's nothing that a parent would not do. However, when we look at God, we look at God sometimes and we think that God's less than a loving parent towards us. Now, I want you to think this morning and ask this as straightforward as I can. Many of us view God as a God who's going to, to send people to hell. Most of us have that idea. But let me ask you, is there any parent that your child could do something, anything, that you would subject them to eternal burden in hell. Would any parent want that on their children? There is nothing your children could do that you would subject them to the eternal torment of hell. However, your children could distrust your love. They could leave you and they could create a hell of their own making. Amen. We also have a, a Heavenly Father that would go through, not just do anything, but go through anything for us to save us from the hell of our own making. He came himself and experienced that hell on the cross so that we would not have to experience the hell of our own making. Are you with me? And, and that's the difficulty of our best days. We don't see God as a loving father. See, there's a huge difference between believing God and, and trusting God. And, and pride begins in this place where the servant, servant tries to get us to distrust the goodness of God and rely on ourselves. The devil doesn't attack your beliefs, he attacks your trust. 
It's one thing to believe. It's something much different to trust God. The serpent tries to get us to doubt God's intentions, to doubt God's goodness. And and see, here's what happens. We begin to doubt God's goodness, and then we begin to operate day to day on our own self-sufficiency, our own abilities. And and most of the time, we don't even know this is happening because we believe in God. And most of us would say, you know, I believe these things. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in God. We're committed to God. But most of the time, we go through each day relying on ourselves and depending on ourselves. Here's the ultimate arrogance of pride. And I don't think we do this cognitively. We're oftentimes not even aware of it, but here's what we do. God, I know you created me and you gave me life. And I'm so appreciative of all that you've done, God. But most of the stuff I go through, I can take care of all myself. I don't want to bother you with all these things. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. That was the intention of the serpent. You know the difference between good and evil. You can be like God. You can do it yourself. You don't need God. And this is where we as Christians, we we, we try to imitate Christ. I know the difference between right and wrong. I read the Bible. I know what God wants me to do. But a lot of things I can just take care of myself. I mean, all the big things, when when things become really big, I'll I'll, I'll come to you, God, and I'll depend upon you. But most of the time, I'm just going to act on my guts, my feelings, my instincts. And depend upon myself. That's called self-dependence. See, we don't have the power to be like Jesus. And if the devil can get me to rely on myself, I'm going to fail every single time. Because I don't have the source in me by myself. I am broken. So so here's the problem. We act most of the time as believers in self-dependency, but we've been created for or to be interdependent. We've been created to be interdependent with God. God is spirit, and life is in the spirit. It's amazing, when the spirit leaves the body, we've been to funerals, and it's just a corpse there, there's nothing you can do to bring the corpse back to life. It it looks the same, but life has left the body. Life is in the spirit. And I have no life apart from my relationship with God. Again, it's a relationship, not religion we're talking about. But when I am self-sufficient and I'm depending upon myself, that's when it's just religion. I know what to do. I can take care of it. But doesn't, God doesn't care about my religion. He cares about the relationship He wants me to have with Him. And we are created not only to be in relationship interdependent with God, we've been created to be in, interdependent with God's creation, with this earth? Do we realize, have you thought about it recently? We can't live without the earth. So we better be listening to discerning what we hear, what we see happening. Do you know what the most precious resource is going to be in about 90 years from now? Not going to be oil. Drinkable water. Who would have thought a few years ago we'd be buying a bottle of water? Can anybody ever imagine such a thing? We were created to be interdependent with the earth. We are created to be independent with God. And, and here's what happens. The serpent's strategy is to destroy life. To create independence. Which creates isolation. And we have a little taste the last three or four years here of what isolation does. We're not meant to live in isolation. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Notice, God doesn't hide from us. God never withdraws from us. We hide from God. Now to think a little more, a little deeper. When we rely upon our self-dependence, it becomes just belief. And and religion is nothing, it's just what we can see and what we can do and what we don't do. And we reduced it to what we see and what we do. But God is spirit and the only way we can know God is not through our head. That's about doing what is right and talking to God. We know about God in our mind, but the only way to really know God is through our spirit. 
And when we are self-reliant and depending on ourselves, everything we do is simply physical. And, and we lose the, the spiritual ability to even recognize that God is with us. He's present. God is there, just like He's there with them in the garden. But our, our spirit is hidden from God because of our self-sufficiency. But God continues to seek us out. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Now we can see what God did. As human beings, we went into this place of, of atrophy. We kind of just went into our, our shell because we did not use our spirit. So God literally became physical. He's physical in the garden and he came back physically as Jesus to get our attention. That's how lovingly God is. That's how much he cares about us. Not only does our self-dependency lead us to isolation from creation and isolation from God, but we get into isolation from each other. We're created to be interdependent on creation, on God, and each other. Look at verse 12. Immediately there is this breakdown in intimacy in this relationship, this marriage relationship between Adam and Eve. So the man says... The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. She made me do it. Here we are created for interdependence, and it's completely broken down. Not only in that marriage, that husband and wife, but in the family. Because as they had children, there continued to be this breakdown. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, we hear, God has one of the most important questions of all. We hear about the first murder. That's a breakdown of relationships I've ever heard of one. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? And what does Cain say? Here's the indifference. Or I could say, Here the indifference, the self dependency, the self sufficiency. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? See, when we become self-sufficient, here's pride. You become indifferent of your responsibility to the needs of people around you. Pride is the root of every other sin. We, we lose humility. We become indifferent. Indifferent to things that we see and different to things that we observe. It just becomes a blur to us. To the environment, to the needs of others, to hunger and starvation and malnutrition. We don't want to think about those things. We don't think about those things. See, this is what pride does. Self-sufficiency gives this illusion that we're in control. Especially if we've been blessed in some way by God's goodness. If you've experienced success and financial security, you begin to get in this little bubble of isolation in your own life. You begin to get protective of your life. Your time and your resources. You, you say things like, I don't have time to do that. Or I'm just too busy. We forget that our time is God's time anyway. But we find ourselves in a place, we need to name it as pride. I have gotten pride in my life. And we need to go to the Lord and to deal with that. Because if not, it is terminal to your soul. We're either led and empowered by the Spirit in humility, or we were driven by our appetites. What did it say again in verse 6? When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for giving wisdom, she took some and ate it. We were driven by our appetites. Your appetite is stronger, is a stronger force than your mind. And, and, and again, the landscape is cluttered with, with good people who succumb to their appetites over their minds. See, as Christians, we, we enter into this relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and when we do that, we need to be careful. When we're in this relationship with Jesus, then the Spirit is going to be the source of our life, and, and, and we become witnesses to other people. And that is when we are dangerous to the devil. If you're in a relationship with Jesus, you, you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, you are a threat to the devil. And when you are, the serpent is going to come along and try to make you or trick you or try to become self-sufficient. 
And when you're self-sufficient, you become prideful. When your pride meets hunger, you will do unthinkable things. Every one of us, me too. We will justify stealing. We'll justify cheating. We'll, we'll justify abusing others or lying. And we'll do those things. You see, that is why belief in God and self-sufficiency will not work. The virtue of pride is humility. Humility is that daily dependence on God. Trusting God. Dependency upon God. It's that moment by moment trust. It's trusting the Spirit of God in me to help me be who I should be. You know, there's one other person in the scripture I want to mention today that I think kind of brings this all together. In 2 Kings 5, 1, I put this in your notes. It's a man named Naaman. That the scriptures tell us that he was the commander of an army, of the army, of the king of Aaron. He was a great man in the sight of his master, highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory over Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Pride is like leprosy in our soul. We can be a valiant soldier, but we can still have something there that is, that is keeping us from being all that we should be. We, we can't imitate Christ. It's, it's only in humility and day by day in trusting Him can we become what God wants us to be. The Lord had a great word for the people as they were entering into the promised land. Forty years wandering in the wilderness. Here's what God said. And I think it's a good word for us today as well. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands. It says, when you come into that land of promise, and you've eaten, and you've had your fill, remember, God says, I brought you here. Yet if you remember a time when you cried out to God, you were down, you were in the pits, things were terrible, you didn't know how you were going to get out of it, and you said, God, help me. Listen, every time you pray that prayer to a loving parent, to God, God will do whatever's in God's power, which is everything, to answer that prayer. He does. He'll bring you into the land of the promise, and you'll eat beyond your imagination, and what you need to remember is that the very thing, your dependence on God, that got you there, to that place of promise, you need to remember and do the same things that got you there while you're there. You need to remember the Lord, keep His commands. We need to ask Beth to come play. We're going to do something. We haven't, we haven't done this in, in a little while. But I'm going to open up the altar today. And I'd invite you, if you're a valiant warrior, and you have leprosy, you have pride, and you want to start these messages, all these sins, you want God to help you, you want to recognize, you want to be cleansed, I want to invite you to come to the altar. To say, God, help me get this pride out of my life, this dependency on myself out, that I'm going to completely trust in you. I didn't let you come forward to the altar for prayer. You want to be dependent on God and trust God alone. Would you come?
but that when we come asking for forgiveness, you are so ready with arms wide open, ready to forgive. Lord God, we thank you that there's nothing we can do that will ever make you cast us away from your love or presence. But Lord God, it's not enough to live in your presence. We want, to, we want our lives to be used to shine brightly, to not be mean, to not be judgmental to, towards anyone. Lord God, help us be demonstrators of your sacrificial love. Help us bless this planet. Help us bless you. Help us bless one another. Realizing, God, that you have given us the breath we have in our bodies, the lives we have. Help us, God, be more dependent on you each moment of each day. We ask this in the name of our Savior and our Lord. In the name of Jesus, the Christ. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless you to go. You can join us back tonight at 6 o'clock. We invite you to come back.